thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. I'm actually not going to talk very much about Click as a software company uh, at all. And rather, I'm going to spend some time hopefully taking the conversation up a level and talk about human beings, data, and decisions, and about how human beings make decisions and how involved computers should be uh, in those decisions. So uh, I thought this would be an interesting topic for this audience uh, because, of course, we're in Silicon Valley. And I believe that there is a, a bit of a debate brewing in the Valley about the, roles that, uh, the role that computers play as part of how we make decisions. Um, and, and in some ways, the very fact that we're sitting here today and that I'm standing here and presenting to you in itself is a little bit crazy. Why are we here? Why would we bother to come sit in a seat and listen to an actual three-dimensional flesh and bud person talk to you about a topic? Why didn't you just send your iPhone? Better yet, why didn't I send my iPhone? Right? That would have saved me a flight. Right? So something's going on in this room about why we're sitting together and we're having a conversation about data and information and computers and decision making right, that causes us to feel like doing it together in person is actually important. And as I said, in the Valley, this is an important debate because a lot of Silicon Valley, I believe, is set up to remove human beings from the decision-making process, right? To take computers out, right? Look at the self-driving car, right? Could there be an example of a more uh, perfect example of removing the human being from a, a daily experience that we all have. But let's go back a, a step and let's talk a little bit about uh, technology and how it impacts our lives. So this is a tap. This is the ultimate in simple levers and puller, pulleys for technology. And human being, as human beings, we've been employing technology to make our lives better uh, for a long time. Uh, interestingly, the tap itself wasn't actually patented until 1845, fairly recently. And as a technology, the tap uh, has made a huge impact on everybody's daily life. Right? The ability to take high pressure water from a source and distribute it around the home, change sanitation, change disease vectors, change people's daily lives. And if we continue with our watery theme, Right, the washing machine, right? So here we take a technology and we move it into the home. Over the course of human history, from 1900 uh, until roughly the 1970s, the number of hours per week we spend as human beings on the sort of daily management of our household has gone from about 58 hours in 1900 to under 20 in the, in the late 70s. And it'd be fair to say that the application of this type of technology, and to be fair, not just the washing machine, but the dishwasher, right, and all sorts of other technologies, changed uh, not only how much time we spend in the home, but also the relationship that uh, women have with daily work and freed up uh, women to work in the workplace, changed the relationship that men have with their children, change the relationship the communities have with each other, right? So the technology here not only changes our uh, use of, uh, of in, in the TAPS case, water, or in the washing machine's case, uh, washing, but also our relationships with each other. So this is a case of, of technology really coming in and changing our relationship with each other and, with, with, uh, uh, and how we expect and, and to use data and information. In the case of the washing machine, uh, and in fact, in the case of much of humans' use of technology, this is really about efficiency. How can we take the daily drudgery that we have in our lives and remove it, right? Take it out of our lives and make it so we can focus on other, more important things. So kind of freaky, isn't it? This is a, a little robot created over 200 years ago the design of which was intended to 
uh, uh, or w the, which in fact has a whole, about 6,000 moving parts in it. it uh, you can't see in the picture, but it's holding a quill. It can write over 40 characters. Its eyes move, its mouth opens and closes, right? This is a little robot designed by a Swiss watchmaker. It completely replicates the experience of a little boy with a quilled pen. So as human beings, we desire technology which imagines that it's actually human. So this is a, not a computer, but a piece of technology which we could imagine as actually a replacement for our human beings. And so as humans, we have and use technology, and we have a dream of having a technology which removed us from the decision-making process. But this is a very positive vision of the idea of the human being removed from decision-making processes. But it also has a dark side. So in our own narratives, our own uh, Hollywood narratives, we imagine that when we invent technology which makes decisions for us, that maybe it gets too good. Maybe the, the technology gets so good at making decisions that it wakes up one day and realizes there's not much need for us. Who's in service of who? In the first case, the little boy, the 6,000 part automata that's writing out the characters that the person types in, he's clearly working in service of the inventor. But in the Terminator case, which luckily hasn't actually happened yet, in case anyone's worried, right? the computers have turned around and found us wanting and said, we're actually the problem. So truth must lie somewhere in between these two extremes. Technology can't just be in service of the human being, and it can't eventually overtake us. In fact, if you look at how computers actually impact human decision making, the results are typically much more pedestrian. Our daily interactions with, te with technology as it relates to decision making are typically the computers getting in the way. We've automated a decision process, we've put in place a computer system that helps us, helps us make a decision, and we spend our day battling with the technology to get out of the way of making the right decision. We had this experience not a few minutes ago in the back with the laptop, the projector, and the PowerPoints all needing to be in, in perfect alignment to make sure the slides show up on the screen. So as, a, as decision makers, we're pretty used to using technology to aid us in our decisions. We typically use technology to automate the more manual or mundane types of decisions that we have as executives running a business or as humans in our day-to-day -day life. Things like you know, validating that an invoice is correct, ensuring that an order can be shipped on time because we have the correct inventory. Right? These are the types of processes that organizations have put in place where automation of those decisions is actually helpful. So we're pretty good at understanding the automation uh, of decisions. So what is it that makes a decision one that which we can automate? So this is a set of bullets from Gartner, so we'll give credit where credit is due. Gartner says that decisions that can be automated by a computer typically have a structure. They, they're fairly operational decisions. They're very well structured decisions. They're predictable, repeatable, of low individual value. So doing them lots of times is not very, very high cost. And generally rely on a relatively low level of human interaction. So these are the sorts of decisions which we should expect as human beings where computers can be really helpful in helping us make better decisions. But the challenge, of course, is there are lots of decisions that don't meet these criteria. Should we launch the new product? Should I quit my job? Should we have the baby? Should we get married? Right? Not yet, I don't believe, are we in a position where we turn those types of decisions over to the computer. So there's a set of boundaries here where some sorts of decisions are easy to turn over to computers, right? Is the invoice ready to, to be uh, sent to the customer? And others, and where the computer is less valuable, am I in love? So 
there's a, a sort of distinction between the kinds of decisions that we should expect computers to help with and those that we shouldn't. And that's because decisions aren't all black and white. Right? Not all decisions are ones which we can turn over uh, to computers that we should expect that we can make automatable from a computer system perspective. So I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about what makes decisions or what role human beings should have in the context of making these decisions. Again, it's my view that in Silicon Valley, we're in the verge of a debate on this very topic. There are, other, there are people, in fact, you may have them as speakers later in the day, that would take a very different perspective on this slide. They would say, you know what? There aren't any decisions where a computer shouldn't make them on our behalf. Right? These are the people that are inventing the self-driving car, or who believe an algorithm would be better at telling me whether I am in love than I am. Right? So we are at a point, I believe, as an industry about having a debate on this topic. And there's a reasonable debate, and one where people can reasonably differ. So there are three things that I believe make, uh, that are uh, key realities that influence the role that human beings play, and, and frankly, the challenges and strategies we should have as organizations around decision making. So they are impermanence, uncertainty, and debate. So three realities about decision making that make human beings an integral part of decision making, and that where we as technologists shouldn't imagine eliminating the human, in fact, quite the contrary, should imagine integrating the human into that decision-making process. Impermanence, uncertainty, and debate. So let's look at each in turn. Impermanence. The idea of impermanence, simply put, is that the systems we work in are dynamic and ever-changing. Whatever things are, they'll be different tomorrow. Things are always, and nowhere is this more obvious and better stated than this idea of the single version of the truth. For me, the single greatest myth perpetrated by the BI software industry. The picture, it's a little hard to see, but the picture is of the Rosetta Stone. So we all think of the Rosetta Stone as this wonderful invention that was discovered that helped us trans, uh, to, to learn the meaning of uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics because it had three languages on each side. But I would ask, does anyone actually know the truth of the Rosetta Stone. What was written on the Rosetta Stone? So the Rosetta Stone was actually a decree for the divine cult of uh, Pelemony V, ruler of Egypt. Anyone still a member of the religious cult from Pelemony? Pel <laughs> no? Interesting. Oh, we have one. Good, luckily. So here's a king in Egypt who spends a great deal of time, energy, and money to inscribe on a piece of stone the great truth of his divine rulership of a region. So much time and energy that he actually goes to the trouble of translating it into two other languages, which he puts on other sides of the room. In case you, you happen to not speak Egyptian hieroglyphics, or you know, then he had it in the other two languages, just so you wouldn't lose sight of this great truth. Writes it down in rock and immediately it's irrelevant. Immediately it decays. It goes away, becomes impermanent. Now, this is the sort of thing we see organizations doing all the time. Trying to create a single version of the truth. Working so hard to get all of their data into the world's biggest data warehouse. Right? Building Rosetta Stones. Trying to get a sense of truth in their data. And so our view is that this is uh, simply unsuccessful. The moment you write something down, the moment you encode it, especially the, in a way, the, the more permanent you make it, the less likely it is to have longevity. And why is that? Because information decays. It's a property of information that it displays entropy. The moment you put something encoded as a fact, its value and its usefulness is decaying. A good example of this, and a slightly funny example of this, is the Doomsday Book. The Doomsday Book was written in the year 
1,083 in the United Kingdom. It was a uh, accounting of uh, the, the, the land around uh, um, England, how many people had how many hectares of um, farmland, et cetera. It was used mostly for taxation purposes, but it has great importance in the UK. As a public service, the BBC encoded the entire Doomsday Book in 1983, the 900-year anniversary of the Doomsday Book, on a laser disc. Anyone got a laser disc player? It's a really nice idea. Right? Let's take this really important artifact and we're going to make it permanent. It's written on paper, the paper's decaying, that's a problem. We'll put it on laser di disc. Within 15 years, the laser disc etchings had atrophied to the point where the disc was unreadable. And worse yet, the LaserDisc reader didn't work anymore. 15 years. And this is the point. Information, as soon as you encode it, becomes an atrophies, right? And it, the, the idea of writing it down and keeping it permanent, it's a false goal. So what do we do? We can't imagine uh, the single version of the truth. We can't encode information because it atrophies. As practitioners, we need to work on building responsiveness into our system. So the picture is the Boeing Dreamliner wing. And the designers of Boeing recognized that the wing of the aircraft was going to operate in a space which had high variability. Different winds, different loads, right? And so they had a choice. They could engineer the, the wing with fixed panels and, and uh, flaps that responded to changes in the environment. Or they made it flexible. By building flexibility into the wing, they allowed it to respond to changes in its environment, and it becomes a better overall system. So if we take the same design metaphor for data and information, building data and information systems which recognize that information atrophies and that we live in an age of impermanence, and designing a system which is responsive and flexible means that we will design better data and information systems, better for decision making. So the next uh, reality is uncertainty. So we've talked about impermanence, things go away. We'll talk about uncertainty. So uncertainty, of course, is this idea that we don't know everything. Or as Donald Rumsfeld would like to say, we don't know what we don't know. The unknown unknowns. So the world is an uncertain place. In fact, if you ask CEOs, they will respond that uncertainty is one of the key drivers of concern they have about their business. So we live in an uncertain age, a time when it's difficult to understand what truth and reality is. We try to create perfect data. So how many of us have been involved in data-driven decisions, data projects, which have been delayed because of the desire for perfect data? We'd love to get going on this really important project, but we're going to work on our data quality first. Right? So it's my view that in an age of uncertainty, we don't have time for perfect data. And in fact, I would suggest that like unicorn tears, perfect data is actually a false goal. I was involved with, I've been working in this uh, space for a number of years now, I've, I was involved with a customer that was using uh, data and analytic software on top of data, and it took the normal approach, said we gotta work on our data quality before we get going, cleansed the data so well, eliminated all the strange noise, that they actually eliminated the interesting insights, the fraud that was occurring, and the process and abnormalities in the underlying systems. How do we know this? Because after waiting so long to, for them to get the data perfect, we simply put the tool on top of the raw data, and all kinds of crazy things popped out. And these crazy things, some of them were errors, sure. But an error is information too. And some of them were fraud. And those aren't errors. That's a problem. So, Having the goal of perfect data is itself a false, uh, a false narrative. And this is increasingly true in the world in which we operate in today. Think about something like the Internet of Things. 
right? You've deployed 10,000 sensors across a warehouse, measuring 50 points a minute, transmitting them back. If one of those data points is anomalous, right, is that a problem? Or was it that Joe kicked the sensor on the way over to, you know, is it, is it completely uninteresting? So in a world where we see increasing amounts of data and increasing variability with the data, working on getting to perfect is a false narrative, a false goal. Not only do we live in an uncertainty with regard to uncertainty with regard to the data itself, but in the environment in which the data live. We used to live in a world where we could imagine the perfect end user, right? He had a standard issue PC from our IT department with a very specific version of Internet Explorer. Anyone remember that browser on it, right? And we knew exactly what to expect from him or her. But today, bring your own device, right? You could walk into a conference and the projector is using a, uh, you know, a version of Linux trying to project his PowerPoint, right? You might have uh, a user who comes in and expects to use his iPhone or his Android tablet to do the work. So the IT environment we operate in displays the same level of uncertainty that the, uh, the, the data itself. For those of you who are wondering about the pretty picture, these are the screen resolutions available to you if you need to code an application towards an Android device. So the idea of a standard single IT environment that we get to work and operate in itself is false. We operate in a heterogeneous environment with many different devices across large amounts of uncertain data. So uncertainty is our new reality. We're not getting away from uncertainty. So this all sounds very dark, which I apologize for. The flip side to uncertainty, of course, is opportunity. And in fact, I would argue that many of you in the room, this is precisely why you're here. The essence of uncertainty is it, uh, it provokes decision. If we don't know which way to go, we have choices, that's what creates opportunity. The, the quote is from uh, HBR. But the point is out of uncertainty comes opportunity. So you know, the, the, the challenge of uncertainty is responded to with uh, seeing where those points of uncertainty are and then looking for opportunity uh, within them. And that is ultimately a very human uh, endeavor. Since we don't know what's around the corner, we rely on the human being to come and guide us. So that brings me to my third reason, and that is around debate. So we have impermanence, nothing lasts, uncertainty, we live in uncertain times, and debate. Luckily, we generally don't live uh, in a dictatorship, short of North Korea. So we live in an environment where we expect everybody to contribute as part of a decision-making process. We don't live in a dictatorial uh, environment where we expect decisions to, to come, on from, come from an authority figure, come from on high. So debate is a natural part of the decision-making process that we embark on. And the most important part of the debate process are stories. So stories are uniquely human narratives about data, information, and perspective. So you should reasonably be thinking to yourself, what in the world does stories have to do with decision making? Aren't stories biased? Right? People come to, come to a debate with a point of view. They're trying to convince me of something. How can that have anything to do with making a decision? And to me, this is almost exactly the point. The narrative process is one that's been left out of the decision-making process. If we had more debate, we would make better decisions. In fact, this is a great quote from Alan Weber from Fast Company. The essence of conversation and debate about data and information is the work of the modern enterprise. This is how we make better decisions with data uh, and information. And users today expect this as part of their daily work. This is Arthur's round table from the Knights of the Round Table. Itself actually a very big innovation, 
because the concept that King Arthur had was that everyone at the table was an equal member of the conversation. A round table, by its nature, doesn't have a head. There's no head of the table. And yet, in a lot of our data implementations, we think in this typical hierarchical fashion. The report developer will generate the report and send it to the end user, the, the passive recipient of this great insight from on high. But if we involve or we imagine a model where debate is at the center of decision making, then we should imagine that everybody's an equal participant in the data analytic process. So three realities, impermanence. We can't expect a single version of the truth. We can't expect things to not change. Uncertainty, can't be sure that everything, that, uh, we can't be sure of anything. And debate, involving everybody as part of the decision-making process. So this is a quote from uh, Warren Bennis at MIT. So how do we bring back this idea of decision-making and the human process back to, the, uh, to how computers will participate in that decision-making? So in the future, the factory will have two employees, a dog and a man. The man's there to feed the dog. The dog's there to avoid touching the machines. Right? Warren uh, said this in the 1960s as we were just moving towards this model of a computer uh, um, mediating decisions. And he is imagining here a future where there really isn't a role for the human being as part of decision making processes. But clearly, he said it in jest, he said it ironically, and this isn't in fact the case. Quite the contrary, we expect and we should expect humans to be a unique part of the decision making process. We have to embrace the human qualities that we all share that allow us to make better decisions in the face of, all right, why don't you go forward two slides, two click, because humans are adaptable, doubtful, and questioned, which are exactly the qualities we need in light of the features of decisions in today's. Briefly, a short advertisement. If you want to jump to the next slide. Uh, at Click, we're really focused on this idea of building software which puts humans at the center of decision-making processes, rather than eliminating the human being from the decision-making process, rather to put them at the center of it. And lastly, I'll leave you with my answer to the Silicon Valley debate, which is that it's really about a partner. It's not the machine or the human, but really the two brought together, bringing their, each their unique skills part of the decision-making process and allowing us to actually create a future where we're not supplanted by the machine, but rather augmented by it. So with that, I am done.